ready for prime time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're live now? Okay. <laughs> we are live. Hallelujah, praise God. <laughs> okay, welcome to, to uh, the Thursday night revival at uh, Battle Cry. And we're still sort of organizing a little bit, but we are here. Uh, my name is Mark, and uh, my wife is Diane on the piano. And we'll be getting some worship in, praise God. Um, before we begin, I um, would like you to go out and kind of pan around. We have a few people here, and you need to move in just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Sarah. move in so you can kind of share in, the, in this, please. It's yeah. a small group, but... Yeah, we have a small group tonight, but we're having a new... Uh, we're enjoying the new format of a round table configuration where we are just sharing uh, and we will be talking about the um, armor of God tonight and we will also uh, I'll give some uh, some papers out here in a minute and we'll get some uh, get it started Diane uh, go ahead and start leading us in some worship please thank okay. you well, hallelujah. hallelujah thank you father we give you the glory for tonight we thank you for this time in your word, and we thank you for just being here in your presence. We give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, Mark failed to say it, but we are at 3707 East 101st at Chapel in the Woods. We're here every Thursday night, 7 p.m.-ish. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, uh, oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Our um, Katie and uh, Aaron, as well as Lindsay, are up in Colorado. They're preparing for a, an outreach up there at a festival, and we need to be lifting them up in prayer because... Boulder, Denver, Colorado, needs a lot of prayer. <laughs> needs a lot of prayer. But <clears throat> anyway, let's, let's get into the presence of God. And I love some of the oldies. Uh, <clears throat> so, but getting into the presence of God is what is most important. Hallelujah. You are Lord. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning a song shall rise to thee.
Oh. 
a song because of the blood of Christ Jesus the
It is so good to be in his presence tonight. Praise God. Um, wow. You can come over and sit down at this on the other side of the board here, sweetheart. You know, you're welcome. So we can go ahead and get started. Um, what we're doing tonight is uh, we're going to be discussing the armor of God. Um, and I've been, Diane and I have been both going through Rick Renner's book, Dress to Kill. It's kind of like a spiritual checkup. Every once in a while, you need to go back to the foundations of your faith and reread things. And when you have a, a, a book that's life changing, that you know that, that if you were in Bible school like I was at Victory Bible Institute, under Pastor's Although Bell. that particular book was not written back then. No, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> but, however, um, it is used in Bible schools and training sessions all around the world. Uh, and Rick and his wife are in, uh, have been in Moscow for several years and raised up several churches in Moscow after the Iron Curtain fell. Um, this is a, a really comprehensive book with all the Greek words of scriptures broken down and explained. Uh, I'm not a Greek scholar, and I never have been, and uh, when I see Greek letters on the back of somebody's car from a fraternity, <laughs> I, 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 if I can see Alpha and Omega, and, and, and I know what those two letters mean, yes, and, and the beginning and the end. And beyond that, I really don't have any other comprehension about uh, what Greek actually is, unless I'm really immersing myself in the word and, the, and word studies, which is really important. Um, anyway, 
Um, we're going to get right, we're going to dive right in. Uh, when you think of armor, what, is it, what are some of the things you think about with armor? Anybody? Protection, metal, swords, weapons, weapons, right? You think of being prepared for battle. Right. So one of the things that I think of, you know, uh, I don't know how many times I've seen the, I have seen the movie Patton, but that is one, one movie that it really he knew how to use his armor. And, and he knew how to lead his troops and motivate them to uh, do what was required. And that's really important because this is what was required by us. It's not a... Uh, it's not an option. It's not an option. We know that we are going to be persecuted and we are going to have trials and tribulations. But as the title in the book says there, it says you, we don't you have, don't have, you to, don't take have to take it anymore. it anymore because you are dressed to kill. All right? So I'm going to give you a definition of armor. Uh, this is from the um, uh, Webster's Dictionary. Uh, it's defensive arms. Any the habit. old Webster's yeah, dictionary. That's 1828. Defensive arms. Any habit worn to protect the body in battle, formerly called a harness. Complete armor formerly consisted of a cask or helmet, um, gauntlets, tassels, brasses, crushes, and covers for the legs for which the spurs were fastened. Uh, in English statutes, armor was used for the whole apparatus of war, including offensive as well as defensive arms. Statutes of armor directed what arms every man should provide. Um, in a spiritual sense and good conscience, uh, by faith, Christian graces are called armor. A coat of armor uh, is, uh, is, a, is really what... What, what Rick dives into inside his book explaining what each piece of our spiritual armor is. And the actual text for, uh, for the, the study is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And so we're going to dive into that. But what I'd like to do here, too, is, is give you a few scriptures about armor. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14 and do this knowing the time and that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. And for now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. How many know that's true? Amen? I mean, I got born again when I was about the age of 14, but I didn't know who I was in Christ, you know? But I did, uh, you know, once I found out, after I got out of the Marine Corps, who I was in Christ, I mean, I was so hungry for God that, I mean, wow, the change was enormous. Um, yes. But I'm going to tell on you a little uh -huh, bit. Go ahead. <laughs> he was on fire for God. I mean, Mark and I knew each other back then. Um. Because of both of our stubbornness, we didn't date at that time. My dad tried really hard to get us together mm -hmm. and to keep, get me away from the guy I was dating and I married. And that was a big mistake. But Mark had one area that he didn't submit to God. And it ended up where he walked completely away from God. So just because you have your armor on right now does not mean you are safe for eternity or even the rest of your life. You have to keep your armor on all the time. There's because Satan doesn't play fair. No, he does. And he will does. take every mistake and amplify it and turn it against you every way that he can. Thankfully, God is the God of the second chance, the third chance, and the fourth chance. That's but right. But you don't need to push it. Amen. 
It was a thing of, it was less than 10, it was probably about six or seven years after I got married that I ran into Mark, and he was completely lost. I did not even recognize her when I walked out of the plasma center where we met it on was, Admiral. We were in, yeah, we were in the plasma center. He didn't recognize me, but I recognized him. And it grieved my heart to see how far down he had gotten. Yep. But God, but so that's why I, I bring that up to say, this is not something to play with. This is something to be serious about. Absolutely. Because, you know, and I, I had fears in my life. That's why I went with the other guy because I didn't think anyone else would have me and <laughs> yeah but God redeems yeah, amen he but saved God you redeems. for me honey <laughs> <laughs> glory to the Lord well, let's go back and I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, Romans chapter uh, 13 and starting at verse 12. Now, we're talking about how our salvation, ending in verse 11, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night, verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Wow. Put on the armor of light. Wow. <laughs> that is exciting. Verse 13. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. One of the reasons why I got out of, uh, out of fellowship with the Lord is because I allowed that area of my life in lust and the way I looked at women to distract me and draw me out. And God, you know, and I gave, I actually gave Satan permission to do that in my own way long time ago and it was in, involved i mean just common pornography that's what it was and it drew me out and it drew me into a, a relationship that was ungodly and i fell and i fell hard and you know what i'm here telling you if you're in that situation you can repent you can get out of that situation you can be restored I'm a miracle of that, complete and total miracle of that. And the way I look at women today is totally different from where I was at 20, 30 years ago. And I see, yes, I see lots Even of beautiful women. Even 15 years ago. Yes, and that's true. Um, and the way I see women today, I, I, and one of the things that, we got that while I was trying to establish a relationship with my wife, I needed to establish who I was again and how, how I needed to be loved. And that, that's so vital because if you don't understand how to love according to what God says, who you are in Christ, then it's hard to love someone else with your whole heart because you're giving your heart well, to someone else well, or something else. Well, you have to else. receive the love yes. to give the love. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, let's go to uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, I mean, no, chapter 6, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. By the word of truth, the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right 
hand and on the left. We have been declared the righteousness of God in Christ. The first step about putting on the armor of God is knowing who you are in Christ. That, that get that revelation of 2 Corinthians 5.17. For he, whoever, whosoever is in, who's, who's, go ahead and read that, Second Corinthians okay. five seventeen, dear. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Oh, Old yeah. things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yeah. And he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, when, when you are, when you read, see, part of this, this teaching is like a spiritual checkup. When you go to the doctor for a physical, you're, you're going to get a physical checkup. He's going to check all your vitals, everything. He's going to review your, your records and ask you how you're feeling, all of this is going on in your life. And so we need to do the same thing in order to maintain that relationship, that spiritual foundation. Because what happens is that sometimes out here, with, you know, you've got your helmet of salvation on, you know that you're saved, you know that you're born again, but then cares of the world, Things like that. And one way that Rick describes this in the, in, uh, in the teaching is that his father was an avid bass fisherman. And the way Satan does this is that, just like a bass fisherman, he takes, that, he takes a lure and he casts it out there, lets it sit there and twitch it, you know. If anybody's a fisherman in here, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You're, you're twitching that lure. You're trying to entice that fish to strike. And I love to catch a nice fish. <laughs> oh, that is so much fun. When that fish actually hits your lure and you set the hook, you know what? And that's when the devil laughs. That's when Satan starts laughing and says, I got you. I've got you. I've got you now. And he's... And, and, and what happens is that that, that thought it keeps coming back to your head. It keeps coming back in from out here. And if you allow that to penetrate and get in here and get into your heart or something, then what's going to happen is that that entices you to go in and, and, and to do those certain things or to believe that lie. And next thing you know your relationship with the Lord is changing around you and you're not, you're not praying as much. You're not in the word as much. You're not going to church or fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters like you were. And that's when, when any of us are in, are in a situation like that and you and some one of your friends in, the, in, your, in your circle of friends, your inner circle of friends notices that you're not around if they don't contact you and try to talk to you and bring you back in, then they need another spiritual checkup as well. Because we are our brother and sister's keepers. We need each other. We need to watch each other's back. One of the main things that I learned in the Marine Corps was that you have to depend on your brother next to you. It doesn't matter what color he was or what ethnic background he has, what city he came from, what a political affiliation he had previously. In boot camp, everyone was equally worthless. That's what we were told. Until they broke us down and they made us into that soldier or to that Marine by being able to obey and march on the orders and then react according to what the sergeant or the lieutenant or whoever was in charge gave us. Come on in. Hello. 
We've got some nice people coming in. Praise God. Hallelujah. You're welcome. Come on in and join in the circle. Didn't know how many people were going to come in tonight, but come on. Grab a couple of chairs over here. And we've got, uh, we've got plenty of chairs. If Our format is a round table. Yeah. And yeah, you guys get to contribute. Yeah, you do. Well, she came in and went to the restroom, I believe. So, yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Anyway. So one of the things that we're, ta <laughs> that we're talking about is the armor of God and how, and how while I was in boot camp, what it really matters. We need to depend, to depend on each other so intimately as brothers and sisters in Christ that you can realize that your sister here has got your back. You can depend on her to come over and pray for you and lift you up in prayer and go with you to a doctor's appointment and hold your hand, cry with you, weep with you, and do the things that a sister is supposed to do. And a brother That includes in Christ. telling you to suck it up. That's right. And fly right. That's right. And as brother and sister in Christ, we are required we also. We just have to do it in love. We have, we have to walk in love. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. Come sometimes, on in, grab a chair it, and pull it up here. Come on. Sometimes it can be a challenge. Right, pull it on up. Um, but, uh, yep, come on in. God is good. Yeah, glad to see you're here. I'm glad to be that you're here. We really are. Praise the Lord. Well, what we're talking about tonight, uh, Christy, is we're, we're, we're going to be discussing the Word uh, and the armor of God and our spiritual warfare, and that's what we're talking about tonight, Okay. Good, good. I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, it really encourages me to know that, that you are listening and watching online. And I don't often see the comments or, or things like that afterwards, but, you know, we are monitoring that with, uh, with comments. And oh, yeah. okay. we've got uh, John Dixon in Honduras. Hello, John. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, also, anybody online, and if you have a question that you want to ask yeah. about the armor of God, you're welcome to ask a question, and we'll try to answer that for you, okay? Now, we're about to get into what I was actually a couple of scripture references that we started with was Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14, and 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, okay? And we're talking about uh, the armor of God on the armor of, uh, verse 7, of 2 Corinthians 6, 7, uh, the, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, and one thing that I realized when I did a study about the armor of God many years ago, one way that the breastplate was attached on the Hebrew uh, army this in the old days, they had a breastplate that came over their front and their vitals and the sides. And then they had some straps that crisscrossed in, back, in the back, but set, left some of the back areas exposed. They also had a shield. They had their sword. They had a lance. They had their, their sandals or their, uh, their, their footwear. And, of course, we know David had a sling uh, and not much else. But what happened is that I started looking for and asking the Holy Spirit, what, what's the back plate? You know, you've, you all, we've all seen suits of armor. And medieval armor in particular covers the entire body. And that's kind of a visual picture. But in the early days of, of, of trying to protect somebody's body, they didn't have all that, all the metals and everything that we had uh, in latter years. But 
I started to go back before that, and the Lord showed me a scripture, and it said that, that when you go out in the battle, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. The glory of the Lord is your rear guard. The angels go before you, and this is something else we're going to touch on and uh, and some of the study that I've been doing on this and what we're talking, and, and Psalm 91, I'm kind of jumping ahead. Um, a lance? It's like a huge, it's like a long spear, okay? Um, if you, uh, if you remember, um, if you ever watched, ba was it, was it um, Mel Gibson and, you know, Braveheart, yes, Braveheart, and in the yeah, they had the lances. They had, in order to, to uh, withstand a charge of of the British horse and and cavalry, they made these huge wooden spears, just real simple, and they kept them all in bundles. They kept them hidden, and they stood out there on the on the battlefield, taunting the the uh, the British. And then when they when they started their charge, William Wallace gave the gave the command, and they all knelt down and they all held up these stabs and they stabbed it down the ground. So when the horses when the horses ran into it, that toppled them over. And all the guys in the back behind had their swords and their their axes out, ready to react and jump on on top of the fallen soldiers uh, of the cavalry and decimated that cavalry charge completely. But that's not the tip, not necessarily the typical way that lances are used. Lances can also be thrown. <clears throat> that's that's right. why they are the unspoken weapon in Ephesians, which mm -hmm. is prayer. That's right. There is no distance in prayer and the lance can be thrown. So it is a far distance weapon. It's not, it's, not, it's not something that has to be used in your immediate vicinity like the belt of truth or the sword of the spirit. Yes. Yes, you release your prayers and they, they go forth and they can have an effect at quite a distance from you. I want to go back to you talking about the Lord being the rear guard. There's two scriptures for that. Isaiah 52, 12 and 58, 8. Um, go ahead and read that, please. Okay. 52, 12 says, For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Amen, man. <laughs> wow. And in 58.8, it <clears throat> says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear guard. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. So that you can be heard on Facebook, I'm going to put the mic in your mouth. <laughs> she can hold it. Let her hold it. Okay. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to be passing the mic around for everyone to actually, if you've got a comment or something, just let us know. We'll, we'll get you the mic, okay? So uh, one time I saw myself in the spirit, and I had soldier attire on. I had a sword, and uh, at the time I was at rest, but I was getting ready to go out into battle. So I was just like, to encourage everyone that, that we are all soldiers. Oh, yeah. And in the spirit, we look different than we do in the natural. And so we do have our uh, 
whole armor on. That's right. All right, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13. All right. Actually, I have a lot more than that. Um, we're going to uh, start by Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Now, what this means uh, is that therefore take up. That means that somebody has dropped their guard. You, ha you need to keep your guard up because... Satan is always out there. He's seeking to whom he may devour. It doesn't mean he, mean he can. It means that he's out there like that fisherman casting his bait in front of you and tapping it on the top of your head. I've seen fishermen cast so accurately that they literally put it right on top of the fish's head. And I've done it myself, fishing for trout. <coughs> but don't you know that trout was smarter than, the, than I was? <laughs> Thank God. I mean, I, you know, every time I go out fishing or something like that, and I can literally, I can literally see the fish swimming in the stream because the water is so clear, and I try to cast a, a bait out there to them, it's as if they're going, na 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 na. You're not gonna catch me, you know. And that's really that's what this one brown trout was doing to me that day, because I put I literally put a fly right on top of where he right in front of his nose, and he didn't strike, he didn't bite, and even though I let it drift right past him, boom boom boom, and I cast it again, do 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 do. He didn't look, he didn't pay it any attention. No, 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 no. That's why it's important for us to recognize the voice of the stranger as Absolutely. the voice of the stranger. That's one of so the things. So that we yeah. don't follow him, but instead we follow the voice of Christ. You see, the whole thing is that what we have to do is we really need to stand, which is to oppose or resist. In the Greek, it says, it, it, the, the word is sentai, to stand upright. Stand upright. You're facing the enemy at all times. You're not turning your back on him. When you turn your back on him, you're exposed. You're exposed. This is why as brothers and sisters, when we see a brother or a sister who's struggling and we go to them and we lift them up and we lift them up with prayer, intercession, we go to them, we say, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Encouragement and encourage is huge. Them. Encouragement is so huge. Do you need, do you know, even with some of the elderly, you, you know, do you need somebody to help go to the grocery store for you? You know? Your neighbor next door may be suffering. You need to, you know, check on your neighbor next door. Even if you've never met them before, go knock on their door and say, Hi, my name is so and so. Or, you know, I am, I, I'm, I live next door to you. And I just wanted to let you know that if you need anything, you're welcome to come over and knock on my door. You don't have to say, you don't have to quote scripture at them. You just show them the love of Christ. Demonstrate the love of Christ for them. And then they'll notice something's different about you. I had a, I had a lady on my, on, that was in a wheelchair, and she noticed on my bus, she noticed that I was different. And it wasn't because I was doing anything different I was just exemplifying the love of Christ and and asking her how she was doing and just you know demonstrating the kindness acts of kindness and love and that's 
That's one of the things, that's one of the love languages that my wife, Ed, really loves is that when I show her acts of kindness by doing service. acts of service and kindness by emptying the dishwasher, making, <laughs> making the bed, and taking out the trash and the recycling. Those are my big three that I have to do. <laughs> you know what? I got to the point where I was really having a good time doing it, too. Because of that, I saw the joy on her face. And you see, that, that young lady on my bus, she left that day encouraged because she recognized that I was a Christian by my love. And that's what Jesus said. They'll know you are a Christian by your love. That's important. Um, stand, therefore, verse 14, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, the belt of truth. Now, one thing that is that reflects is personal integrity. And one thing that I can bear witness about is my wife's personal integrity. When, I, when we first started dating, I really had kind of lost a little bit of that area in my life about my personal integrity. But you know what? When you get around somebody for a long time, and married couples, you know what I'm talking about because you're one flesh. I told her today how much her personal integrity me meant to me. And it, I mean, it has. It has changed me to where, I, I mean, I was in quick trip getting, uh, and, and I didn't have a cup. I needed just some ice and water. And the guy at the counter said, oh, you're good to go. No, I'm not. What do you mean? Uh, I need to pay for this cup of ice. No, ice and water is free. No, that's for refills only. And I had to remind him because he's a new employee. And he said, oh, that's right. You probably just saved my job. And I said, well, look, you know what? Um, a lot of people would have just, when he said, you're good to go, would have just walked right out of the store. And I've also been in quick trips where I came in just for a quick restroom break and I saw people stealing homeless. It bothers me. I know they're hungry, but they're, you know, they're desperate. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't going to stop her. I mean, it, you know, I'm not security. And there's not, there's, but you can say something. I'm sorry I didn't say something, but they, but the people at the counter noticed that she walked out with all the stuff that she did and didn't stop to pay for it. But they couldn't do much about it. That's a type of, that's someone who's lost their integrity. They've, they're lost. So love, going the extra mile. love going the extra mile, yes. So love going the extra mile would possibly say, ma'am, can I buy those things for you? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's one thing Sister Deborah brought out this morning, was that when if you're, you're in a, a quick trip or at a restaurant somewhere and you see a police officer, first responder. Or sheriff's deputy. Or sheriff's deputy, and they're having a meal, she said, offer to pay for their meal or buy them a cup of coffee at the quick trip. Just go up to the counter and say, you see that officer over there? I'm paying for his, whatever he's getting. And hey, you don't, he doesn't have to know about it. And I, I wanted to give this testimony real, real quick earlier this morning at the morning meeting, but it didn't happen. I was at Lowe's kind of late before they closed. And there was an officer in his car outside. And he had his window up. And I, I noticed him when I walked in to go get what it was that I needed to get. 
I came out and I looked over there as I walked past. I went to my, my car and I just felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to just go over and just talk to him for a minute. So I walked, as, as I walked over, he saw I was coming at him, uh, coming towards him, and he had this look on his face like, what's this guy want? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I'm just kind of waving and smiling and, you know, and just, and I walk up there and I, I just say, hey, roll it down, man. So he rolls down his window and I look over and I said to him, how are you doing tonight? Can I pray for you? My wife and I have a prayer group in our home, and we're always praying for our officers. And he was just like, he, first the expression on his face was utter shock that somebody would just come up and offer to pray for him. And then he said, yes, I, I need prayer. And I asked him, what's your name? And he gave me his name. And I said, well, I'm, my wife and I, we're going to pray for you. And I want you to know that there are a lot of people out there who are backing you up in prayer. And as I walked away, I kind of glanced over my shoulder, and he had tears in his eyes. Because I don't know what that man was going through at that moment, but that was a moment, a defining moment for that officer who was going through something that was really a struggle for him. And we see that all the time. I see it all the time. Desperation on, on the homeless faces that come on my bus. And it's why I, I need my armor on every day. As I go, and I have just maybe a few minutes of, of time of driving by myself, I'm confessing the word. Now this is how you stand. Confess the word. Speak it over yourself. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am a new creation in Christ. I am born again. I have eternal life according to John 3.16 because I believe in him. Just simple three scriptures that you can remember and quote to yourself encourages you in the word and lifts your spirits up. Jeff, you got anything to add to that? Brother, that's some good stuff there. <clears throat> yeah, I agree that the, uh, the armor of God is absolutely mandatory. The enemy has got more weapons of deceit in his arsenal. And I had shared this before, that the days of Noah are like unto the coming of Jesus. We are in a similar time to the days of Noah. And so one of the attributes of the days of Noah is deceit. Absolutely. So that belt of truth and knowing the word of God, and like you're saying, not just knowing it, but also having it as a arsenal, as a sword that you can pull out, you have it memorized in your heart so that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you can stand maybe just on that one word. And all it takes is that one word is more mighty than everything that the enemy has. And taking that stand in truth, the enemy just has to back off. He has absolutely no power, no authority, and that's what he fears the most is a believer who knows who they are in Christ because they then he has to flee. He has to leave. I want to key off of that. Yes, you need to know the scriptures for your situation. But if you don't <clears throat> know the right scripture for a situation, you can always pray in the spirit. As I said earlier, marrying the first guy was a total, complete mistake. 
and I went through what I call a level five hurricane with him. You know, you get hit first, then there's a lull, and then you get hit by the harder backside. And it was a thing of anything and everything that could be shaken in my life was shaken. Um, <clears throat> but I remember there was times that I literally was screaming in the spirit and crying because I was so overwhelmed and I felt so alone. How many of y'all been there? Let's see a show of hands. You know, come on, everybody. Yeah. Everybody's but, been there. Amen. But praying in the spirit. Amen. It pulled me through. It pulled me through. And I knew that I knew that I had to stick with God because everything else was not there. That's right. Um, let's take a look also. Let's, 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 let's I want to go on, okay, on go regarding ahead, the belt of truth. That, that on the Roman soldier, the belt is what held everything else together. It's what they hung their sword on. There was a place for their lances. There was even a way of attaching the, the shield to, to it. And, but it's also a thing of with that belt, it was more than just the belt that we wear more modern days. And it protected the reproductive organs. Your life-giving power is protected by truth. The truth of the word will protect that life-giving power. And that's something that Paul, that uh, Rick brings out on there. I'm going to pass around my book that's got some illustrations in it of what we're talking about. You're welcome to look at that, but please do not lose our place, our spots, okay? <laughs> I've got some tabs marked that I'm going to read here in a little bit. And you can look through those pictures in there. Yeah, I don't know if that's got, I don't know if I'm allowed to show that on, on Facebook Live because of copyright, et cetera, okay? But you know what? Rick Renner, hi, we're using your book to teach from, brother, okay, if you don't mind. <laughs> we love you, brother. Amen. Um, the one thing about the uh, that standing with your waist girded with truth, I when I was in the Marine Corps, a lot of my my fellow Marines and brothers were getting tattooed with all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. And I resisted that temptation to get tattooed for many years until I, after I got out of the Marines. And my, it was my family, my mom and my dad, who stood by me in some of the darkest times of my life and held me up both in prayer and also becoming um, uh, guardians for my children while I was down in Texas working and really helping me in every possible way because they loved me and they demonstrated the love of Christ to me. And one of the things that, uh, that I found out is through some of my mother's genealogy and her research is that we have a family crest from Scotland and it's from the clan Macrae or Macraw, depending on how you want to enunciate it. And I wear that crest on my shoulder. And around that crest is a belt, a very wide belt that's buckled. And in the circle of it, you have a, a banner, a little banner that denotes Scotland in the blue and the white banner of Scotland. And then you have an arm 
holding a double-edged sword. And the sword, I had the tattoo artist draw it, draw it out and extend past the actual belt. And it's the way it's, I had asked him to do it is that I wanted it to, to show that it was drawing, it was piercing and drawing blood. And then inside the belt is the, the motto of the clan. And our motto is Fortadine, which is the root word for fortitude. You don't quit in the face of adversity. You don't give up in the face of adversity. You keep pushing forward, you, no matter how hard it is, you keep moving forward, and that's what the armor of God does. When the Roman soldiers hooked up their shields, and I've seen movies about this, that they would make what is called a tortoise, and in that tortoise they could move and they were protected because soldiers in the center were holding their shields over their head and they locked their shields together all around. And no matter what the enemy was doing on the outside, they couldn't penetrate those shields. And that is a picture of the body of Christ together holding up their shield of faith and working through it, working through and moving together for the vision of what the Lord has to do. Well, something that Rick brings out in the teaching is that <clears throat> the, the shield that they carry is not that little cute little round thing. Yeah. It's like the size of a door and each man had a shield that was big enough, wide enough to cover him completely and tall enough. So he was fully protected by that shield. That shield was a combination of... Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. <laughs> just making sure the mic is working, okay? I just... But the, uh, the shield is covered with, uh, with leather, which is anointed with oil, and it is kept supple, and it's also soaked in water so that it will put out the the flaming darts and but it's the thing of rick brings out something about the the measure of faith and it's a thing of he says also you are measured for your shield and it's the measure that fits you and what you're going to be facing so that's another reason why you don't compare yourself with others. God yeah, says not that, to compare yourselves among yourselves. That's right. I can't compare myself to Brother Kenneth Hagin, <clears throat> although he was an awesome teacher, and I admire him so much for what he helped me get through in those early days of my, of my career as a, and looking for uh, what it is. And I, I count him as one of the best word and faith teachers I ever heard. Anyway, um, we're talking about how we stand, and I've got Psalm 91 here. And this, this is what we, a lot of people, when they read Psalm 91, they're, they think it's, it's weak. It's, it's not. Anything it's but. a very militant declaration of faith. Do it's not anything mamby pamby, que sera sera, whatever will be will be. That's what the world thinks, and that's what we are not to do. <clears throat> Psalm 91, verse 2 I will say of the Lord, He is my, my refuge, refuge and, and my, my fortress. fortress. In whom I will trust. Am I God in whom I will trust? I came up with a militant version of... Well, we did. Yeah, together. 
We did. Yes. He who dwells in the secret place shall abide in the Almighty. He who dwells in the secret place shall abide in the Almighty. I will not fear the error by day, nor the terror that comes by night. The Lord is God, the Lord is one. He is my deliverer. That we we were in we were in a a group Sally Abel yeah. Abel's group learning about our Hebraic roots and this is also something I want to encourage everyone to do is learn about your Hebraic roots it doesn't mean you be you're going to convert to being Jewish or anything like that but the symbolism and everything from the previous um, prophets and everything and, the, and what the precepts are in the Old Testament are shadows of what is yet to come and what will be and what is today. Well, when you understand the Hebraic roots, things just take on a greater, you get a greater understanding. Absolutely. I remember the first time I went to a Passover Seder. Oh, it, yeah was like, oh, my word. This is, it really emphasized. And you know what? God said that was something that was to be remembered through all time, was the, the deliverance. And w since we are grafted into Israel, yes, we should be aware of, at least, things yeah and it, yeah. when we did uh, a sukkot a couple of years ago in our backyard the presence of god in that sukkah it <laughs> was so powerful you talk about the camping presence, out in your backyard yeah that the was presence fun <laughs> of god was it was like we really felt like we were spending time with God, and he wanted to be with us. And that was just so much more than what Christianity gave me. Oh, yeah. I'd like to come back to uh, yeah. Psalm 91, verse 4. And this is important because we are talking about the belt of truth, okay? He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Now, this gal here was wanting to say something. I want to get, before we get too far over. You go right ahead. It, it's, it, I, I, I don't want us to get past where you were wanting to say. It was a sentence, so I mean, we'll just go with that. No, we were talking about deception and truth. We are talking about deception and truth, and I discovered something this year, and it's embarrassing how simple it is, because I've done it occasionally, but now I do it almost every day. Almost every day in my prayer time, I bind a spirit of deception for the day. Almost every single day. Absolutely. One of the things I say is I bind a spirit of deception in the mighty name of Jesus. And you would be amazed at the little things that crop up uh, yes. it, it's not just big things, you know, and it, 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 it may be that the small things are actually the big things, you know, but it's turned out to be very important for me, and uh, it can certainly change the direction of my day. And so I just would, it, it's so simple, just I bind the spirit of deception, just add it to your prayers every day, you'll be somewhat startled at what you find out. Yeah, well, and I, there's a scripture that says that it's the, the little foxes spoil the vine. So it's, it's, the little things do matter, and God does care about that. Absolutely. And that, that is a good thing to add to your prayer. I mean, I wish I still had them, but I had a, a series of confessions that I did. Um, it was actually on audio, and 
it was the same length of time to listen to that as it was for my drive to work. And I noticed in just a week of having those confessions going forth, m morning and evening, I started becoming more aware of God's presence, more aware of him speaking to me, because one of the confessions was, I hear the voice of God and the voice of stranger. I, I twisted it, the verse just a little bit to say, I recognize the voice of the stranger as the stranger and I refuse to follow it. And I would also pray for divine appointments. And lo and behold, I started getting divine appointments. And that divine appointment can be as simple as seeing someone and saying, your smile is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Or that, that shirt looks so good on you. Because there's so much tearing down everybody that something as simple as that can make the difference. It might even go so far as to stop someone from committing suicide. That's true. That's very true. I'd like to look at um, Ephesians and verse, chapter 6, and we're looking at uh, verse 16. We're going to go back to 15 about the sh uh, your having your feet shod with the preparation of gospel of peace. We cannot skip that we, one. Well, I know, but um, this is kind of like my notes are not in, in a particular order because I didn't let my wife edit them this time. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just time constraints, okay? Um, Above all, verse 16, taking the shield of faith, which you are able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And Psalm 91, verse 5, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. The fiery darts. And what happens with the shield of faith is that you must renew your faith on a daily basis. You must have fresh oil from the Holy Spirit to anoint your faith with. And you need the washing of the water of the word by dipping yourself into and immersing yourself into the word in order to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And that goes back to standing for whatever it is that you're looking for, whatever it is that you need prayer answered for, it's in that time that you ask the Holy Spirit as you're asking, refresh my cup. You said in your word in, Psalm, in, in Proverbs, you know, you know, Psalms 23, Lord, verse 5, that you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. That's something that I confess almost on a daily basis to help build my faith. Confessing the word is, and speaking it over yourself is how you stand and encourage yourself. And when you need, and when you speaking feel like Speaking the you, word you is can, very important. When you feel like that you are just dismayed or discouraged, call a brother and sister in the Lord and ask them to help pray for you and tell them the worst thing you can do is just hide behind the closed doors. Yep. Hide behind the closed doors and just let that imagination, that vain imagination of the fiery dart that's hit you and continuously coming at you all the time and it's not ricocheting off your helmet because you had that thought come to you. And suddenly, ah, uh, you start to believe it. And the next thing you know, you're feeling that, that, pre that, that, that presence of being, you know, just, I had a bad day at work. I'm totally bummed out. It was a real tough day. And believe me, 
driving a lift bus is not the easiest thing. And when I come home and I close that door behind me, I have to leave that all outside the house. And one of the things that we have on our door is a mezuzah. And what I did is I anointed my door frame in the same manner that Moses did. With oil, did. not blood. Moses did with the children of Israel. And what we did is we took is that I took a ramekin and some olive oil and I mixed cinnamon with it and it turned it red. Just mixing it up. It makes it a red color. And I put it I took my hands and I just wiped it over the mantle of, of the door all around and around the outside of the of our mezuzah and on the back door as well. And what happened is that when I walk through that and the anointing of, and, and the peace of my home uh, is, is there because my lovely wife is at the piano worshiping sometimes or she's at the computer doing something involving music or anything like that. And I see that happening and it's like, it's like I come home and I decompress. I can leave all the cares that I'd happened to me outside and not allow that to penetrate my home because of the anointing. That's really important because you carry the presence of the Holy Spirit. Our, your, your, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that lives inside of you than he that's in the world. I'm kind of jumping ahead here. I mean, it. You it, jumped way past the the, the uh, <laughs> shoes of peace. Yes, I did. That was if, when when I read "Dressed to Kill" the first time back in '91. The chapter on the shoes was the most impactful to me because we think peace. Oh, that is just so soft and sweet <laughs> and no it is a weapon the roman soldiers shoes had spikes coming out the bottom hobnails they were spikes Hobnails. that were anywhere from two to six inches long talk about aerating your lawn <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk about aerating your enemy yeah let's aerate the enemy but <laughs> they could plant their feet trample an enemy but they could plant their feet when they're needing to take territory and with six inches of spikes they ain't moving. That's right. And what, it is yeah. what keeps you solid. It is, it is both an offensive and a defensive weapon, that peace. And since I have seen a meme on Facebook that I absolutely love, says that if you are incapable of violence, you are not peaceful, you're a weakling. Only those who are potential, have the potential for violence and go with peace are truly peaceable. But there's so much truth to it. Yep. There is truth to that. Well, it's, I'll, I'll have to repeat we, it then for the people on Facebook because they won't hear it. Okay, I was listening to somebody the other day who was talking about when people inherit the earth. And it was the, kind of like the, I guess. The, oh, the, when the meek will inherit the earth, okay. The Beatitudes, yeah. The Beatitudes, okay. They looked up the word meek. And the word meek actually means somebody who is armed, to pick something armed, but with holes. 
So the definition of meek is someone who is sufficiently armed, but but withholds. Yeah, they have the capacity. To defend. <clears throat> yes. That's right. That's Meek true. is strength. Strength with restraint. They were not the aggressors. Yeah. I want to get back to um, Psalm 91 here. That's all right. Psalm 91, verse 6 through 8. Nor the pestilence. You're not going to fear the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that laced at at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. This This is a battle, a war that we're in, spiritual war that we're in. But it shall not come near you. Only, in verse 8, only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. When I read verses 7 and 8 in Psalm 91, I see the return of Christ at Armageddon. That is prophetic. Moses wrote this psalm, and it is a prophetic psalm of the army of the Lord moving through the valleys of the shadow of death and fearing no evil, because why? The Lord is with them. The Lord is with us in our hearts. And killer shoes, this is what Diane is talking about, where this is what Rick is talking about in his, um, in the side, the study guide. And I'm going to, Let's do something real quick here. Let me see. Where is that? I thought I... Yep. Lucas, I want you to look that over. I'm going to go to you in just a moment. All right? Killer shoes. I'm going to give you a scripture here about the Criller shoes from Psalm 91 and verse 13. You, that's you, all of us in this room and all of you on Facebook watching tonight, you shall, this is not an option, this is a command, you shall tread on the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. When you are dressed in the killer shoes of peace with those two inch or six inch long spikes on there and you're, you're firmly planted and you are so firmly planted, you got your shield of faith up, you can stand and the fiery darts are coming in You've got your brother next to you. You've got your sister next to you. They're standing with you. And the shields are linked. And the shields are linked up. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding is so amazing. Because you're immovable. You will not be moved. And there's a song. I will I shall, I shall not be moved. That was a song that Martin Luther King and during that, what was it, during it, they were singing it, you know, I shall not be moved. Many years ago. I shall not be moved. The shoes of peace are actually killer shoes. These Roman shoes had two inch Longer hobnails on the soles of the shoe, and the soldier planted his feet on the ground. He was immovable. 
Let the peace of God rule your hearts. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you called in one body, and be thankful. Note, called in one body. The army of the Lord. You are called into one body as an army of the Lord. One body. Now this is not the counterfeit church. This is the truth of the word that we're talking about. The peace of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our, heart, our lives is so vital that it keeps ourselves firmly planted in him. Our confidence is in him, is in him and our salvation purchased by the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? The Holy Spirit who is in you? Or do you not know uh, or, or whom you have from God, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Holy Spirit, when, when, we, are, when we receive Christ, in our, this, going back to salvation and, the, and, and that moment when we first received Christ in our hearts, I remember when I did. And it was, it was not because anybody led me to Jesus. It was because I kept reading those Archie comics about, you know, they're presenting the gospel and the JCT tracks and stuff like that. But as a, as a teenager and as a kid growing up, it, it presents the word in a very illustrated way. And also I'd like to give credit to Don Woods, and Gusty, he came to our church and did. Uh, okay, and, and if did they some. are not longtime Tolsons, they yeah, have no clue who Don Woods was. Don Woods was a weatherman, yeah. Don Woods was a weatherman at Channel 8, and he had the Gusty. Your longtime Tolsons. The longtime Tolsons, yes. And he used Gusty to help to present the gospel. And he had a track and a book of how, of how we were separated from God and all of that. And I, I read that. I got a copy of that, and I read it, and it was amazing. I realized at a very young age, I was a probably just before I was turning 14 or so, that I was separated from the Lord. And I had the fear of God in me, and I did not want to go to hell. So I got down on my knees right beside my bed, and I asked Jesus to come in my heart at that time. And I remember it. It was like the spirit of the Lord, like a warmth of love and like warm honey on bread just melts over and just flows over and fills everything. And, then, and the sweetness of the love just and the presence of the Lord just filled the room. Oh, that was my salvation experience. And you know, Everyone has a similar type of experience, whether it was in a, in a, in a, a, a line at, at uh, uh, a, Billy Graham, a Billy Graham crusade or at a Baptist church down at the altar or something like that. We all have that salvation experience. We all have at that time where it's given that measure of faith and that shield of faith by the Holy Spirit. And we're not to, to judge ourselves or look at other people's faith because we're all in different levels of faith. We're all in different spiritual levels of growth. And what we are supposed to do is to admonish and love one another and help that younger person in Christ grow. That's what we're here for. You got okay, you're talking about the helmet of salvation. One thing that Rick brings out is that the helmet was flashy, but it was also protecting their head, protecting your, the salvation is going to protect your mind, your, your thinking, but it is, 
the thing he's brought out about it being so flashy is that if you are saved, people should be able to see it in how you live your life, how you walk your life. Um, with your, going back to, they'll know you by your love. But, you know, there's the salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God feeds that knowledge of the salvation, and it's renewing the mind also is, is so important because <coughs> most of us didn't, even if those of us who received Christ uh, as a young child, there's still a lot of natural thinking that has gotten in. Sometimes it's because of our family of origin. Sometimes it's because of just not getting good teaching. We knew enough to get fire insurance. Um, but our thinking as walking as Christians, if we're going to be like Christ, we can't be like the world. We've got a different perspective. We've got a different take. And as we renew our mind with the word, we don't keep those worldly thinking we believe that the impossible is possible. And we're able to go forward with him. And it, it comes down to it. faith is, and I love this definition, faith is the complete trust that an infant or small child has that mommy and daddy are going to take care of everything they are safe they are fed protected loved and the world wants us <clears throat> to think that it's a performance base no you don't do a darn thing for your salvation. What you do is the result of your salvation and your walk with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's you do right. it, you turn 180 degrees. That That's the definition of repent is to turn your back on. Absolutely. And so we need to turn our backs on the way of, of the world and, f and, and have our faces in the word. Anyway. That's yes, right. the helmet also protects the ears. And what we hear, yes. Yes. Take That's right. we, have to, we have to put a guard over the gates into ourselves the eye gate, the ear gate, and even what we eat. You know, it's, it's, yeah. Well, we would like to, I asked uh, Lucas to take a look at this section on the, uh, the killer shoes. And I want you to go ahead and uh, find something in there that really is a, uh, something that's enlightening to you. This is from the study guide. I printed off several pages of what we can have time to actually cover. And we are going to be running out of time, and I hope I don't run out of battery on this, <laughs> on the phone either. So um, what we have is we're talking about the helmet of salvation. Um, I'd like to give a couple of scripture references here for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. But let us who are of the day, walking in the light of the word, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of the hope of salvation. 
For, we're, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of the hope of salvation. See, Paul's writing about how uh, uh, he's using the armor of God and he's writing about it even to the Thessalonians. And, but you know, in Ephesians, he gives great detail. This is one reason why I love reading Ephesians over and over and over again. And I recommend that to anyone here and on Facebook Live. Go to the book of Ephesians, open it up, and start reading, and read it out loud to yourselves. Yes. Read it out loud. Get out your Bible app that plays the audio version of the Bible and read along with Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6. It actually doesn't take more than 20 minutes to go through it in that way. And you can have half an hour in the Word, and you can spend another half an hour on your face pleading the blood of Jesus and getting in some time. It doesn't take that much time out of your day. Think about how much time you waste on Facebook or just scanning through all the, some of the other platforms online. Or playing games. There's a lot of times that, that sometimes playing a game is, is good. I like to play chess. And I like to play online. And I like to solve chess puzzles. And there are times when I am trying to think of the strategy behind this puzzle and I don't quite understand it. And thank God there's a little button on the, on the screen that says, hint, <laughs> take a hint. And that's where I think at times in our life when we need a hint, we have the Holy Spirit. We can pray in the Spirit and we can get that hint, hint, hint. And sometimes that hint comes with a little quick kick in the pants that we desperately need. Another question, another thing is that we already covered this. Is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Knowing who you are in Christ enables you to tear down the imaginations and thoughts that attempt to enter our soul realm in the mind and by the power of the Holy Spirit within you, you can tear down the strongholds. A stronghold is anything that keeps you captive under the lie of the devil. I can remember just being enlightened and having a revelation knowledge of something I w while I was in Bible school at, at VBI. And it was something about a doctrine that I had heard that came out of the Methodist church. I don't know, remember what it was. But I remember that grieving inside my heart that I had been lied to. Now there's a lot of good things about some of the denominations. And I'm not backing any one particular denomination, but I am saying that there are, you know, there are traditions of men and false doctrines inside denominational churches and even in some of our own circles. But we have to be on guard. But when the light of the word of the of revelation comes to you and you get that, oh, oh God, what was that? I just realized that that was a lie. And that illumination of the word comes to you, and you get 
that revelation that you had been lied to, but the light of God's word and the peace of God comes on you and it heals that area of your life. That's salvation. That's the helmet of salvation protecting you. Lucas, come on, brother. Give me something. Well, there's, there are actually two things uh, that I want to say, and then I've actually got more of a practical application that I want to, uh, that helps a little bit with this. But in, in Ephesians 6, you know, I find it interesting that Apostle Paul, when he's talking about put on the full armor of God, he tells it to you twice. You know, he says, put on the full armor of God. He tells you what you're guarding yourself against. And then he repeats himself again and says, make sure you put on the whole armor of God. And then he explains what all it is. So if he's telling us all that, and especially the church at Ephesus at that time, I mean, he must have had a pretty good reason for wanting to say it twice and repeating himself, going, this is important, people. Pay attention to it. Exactly. I, you know, I'm. I'm. Exactly. But uh, with that in mind, the, the the practical application, as as I'm listening to this and reading all this, and I'm about to tell you all something in here that very few people, that none of y'all know about me. My my wife knows about this about me. But. <laughs> Oh, I am an absolutely die-hard Captain America fan. I have been for about 10 years. I am. Yeah, oh yeah. I, I, I literally do actually have a movie-grade costume at home with everything. I, I do. Bring it and wear it, mother. So, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> if I didn't have this hairy thing on my face that I love and my wife loves, I might actually do it. But... <laughs> That, I, I say all that because it, I, I say all that because it, it brings up a, a point that ever since I was oh I don't know 18 or 19 years old probably I've always been into intercessory warfare it's just something I've been involved in even though I don't go around just telling everybody that but I have been and several people in my life that know me and are close to me know that about me too but with that being said, you know, the Captain America thing kind of played all into all this over the years, and it actually helped me uh, dive into a, a project. That there's only two people on the face of this earth that know about that, know I'm doing it. But uh, being, how do I put that? I had a vision because every time i see captain america he's a warrior he likes to get right in the middle of it he likes to stand firm for who he is he likes to stand firm for the weak all that stuff and i've always liked that i mean i was in the air force so it kind of goes without saying now ironically captain america was army i was air force if our air force is the very back of the line if they attacked us well you might as well kiss us goodbye because we're not going to survive that i'm just saying it was a running joke but i always get what they were talking about in the process i mean it's it, it's true we weren't warriors but that doesn't mean in my heart that i was not on that matter but uh several months ago god gave me a vision and i had been going through some a rough time in my life a friend of mine a dear friend of ours had died and I and I had had my aunt pass away recently at that time too and both of them I cannot firmly tell you that I knew where they were going uh, I didn't have a peace that they were going to end up in, with the Lord I just I, I had no peace about that I'd love to tell you that I did but I just don't and it was one of the very, I think it was the second or third time I ever actually came in here and this ministry prayed over me and everything, and, and I released it. I, I had a hard time releasing that. I really did. But I got to work the next morning, and the, the morning when I got to work after all that happened, I had the most unique vision I've, I've had in a long time. And I was, I was dressed in armor. I was dressed in a dark room. 
And I was face to face with with the enemy. I was face to face with the devil. Now, if you can imagine being face to, y'all know who Smog is. If I said Smog, would you know who I'm talking about? The the large dragon from Lord of the Rings from The Hobbit. He was that big. I mean, oh, yeah. boy, boy size everything. I, I was talking directly to him. And because of everything I had dealt with, I put him on the ground. I had my foot on his neck, and I had that spike. I had him on the ground. He was squirming, but he was not getting up. He was in pain. He was not happy with me. And I had, I, I had a little dog collar around his neck that I could let him up, but there wasn't any way he was getting up unless I let him. I mean, point blank and simple. I mean, and we're talking about a big dragon. I'm just pointing that out. It, he was huge. But it got up, and he tried to tell me we were going to lose and that I was deceived in, in all this stuff. And I, I'm just going, dude, I'm not listening to you. You lost a long time ago. I can tell you exactly where you lost. I can point it out to you where you lost. He didn't want to listen, look either. And I mean, I eventually had to grab his head and force him to look at that cross and say, dude, that's where you lost right there. Don't try to tell me I've won, you've won. No, you lost a long time ago right there. I mean... I can tell you exactly where you're going to end up, too. I know you're not going to like it, but I'm going to enjoy it anyway while we're at it. But I say all that to say that it taught me a lot about armor and all this stuff because what it did in the long run, in, in those spike shoes and everything, it works. It's real. And even though he did not physically try to attack me at that one point, what the Lord showed me through all this, being a, a fan a long time ago, well, back in the past 10 years, you know, God got a hold of me, and I t he told me I need to release the Captain America thing because he became an idol to me. I'm just going to admit it. He did. And he goes, what are you going to do if the world gets a hold of him and tries to take him in a different direction than your faith is going to take you? What are you going to do? I'm like, well, it'll break my heart, but I'll let it go. And when I met her, among other things, it was the point in my life, I, okay, I've got to let this go. I've, I, I have taken this too far. I, I, I admit it. I took it too far. But while I was at it, God put it on my heart that I could write my own book or my own comic book that had his attributes and my faith involved in it. And for the longest time, I struggled with what the armor should look like. I, I struggled with the look. I struggled with all, what all it could be. And, you know, even looking through this book, it's given me a, a couple ideas of what I need to add and go back. And I recently started all this because I even sent Lindsay a message about telling him that vision, and I told him I was going to write this thing. I'm 22 pages in. I'm just going to let you know. And but the armor looks amazing. It, it, it's going to be amazing, and it's not anything that anybody in this world could ever create. It, it's beautiful. And on that note, please pray for me for this book because it, it's a long oh, yeah. process that I'm, I, I'm going through. But what I'm learning, as soon as I started writing this book, I came under heavy attack. And I've had to learn each morning I have to put that armor on. I have to dress it all. I, I, have to, I have to make sure it's clean. I have to make sure it's attended to. I have to make sure that it's ready because if I don't, I get attacked, and then I wonder why I got attacked. I mean, point blank and simple. I, and God says, well, did you put your armor on? No. Well, what do you think is going to happen if you're not wearing your armor and you got arrows flying at you? I mean, let's think about this here for a minute. you got to clean your armor. Exactly. Well, and that's it, that, you that was clean one of the things it mentions in there too. Is that it talks about cleaning it, the, and the I never soldier, even thought about it. The soldier must clean his armor. It, it's just like when I was in the Marine Corps. We had at the end of every guard shift, we before we checked in our weapons, we had to clean them. We had to clean the barrels. We had to clean the clips, uh, the magazines, the you the action. Put it away so you clean it. Ready it's ready for action Absolutely. to go. And I, I, I had actually thought about bringing my personal body armor with me today, but uh, we had enough stuff to carry in. <laughs> uh, but you think about a modern soldier. The modern soldier 
And I looked up some things on the internet about our modern soldiers. And when you see, see them dressed in their uh, field equipment, the basic field equipment, they have body armor, they've got knee pads, they've got boots on, they've got their helmet on, they have their, all of their equipment inside and ammunition on them inside of, and they've got it on a belt they have it on what's called the mole moly gear they when i was in the marine corps we had the alice packs and that standard that stood for something else and uh there's it's an acronym of some kind but i don't remember what it meant but everything attached together it all comes together and the the loadout for a modern soldier and marine is over a hundred and fifty pounds of gear mm -hmm. including his body armor that the, just the plates alone the breast and the black back plate weigh 12 pounds that doesn't mean the covering that holds them in place there's side panels that go on the side to protect you in the side and there's the helmet that covers the guy's head, made out of Kevlar and bulletproof material and all this, and that is the most serious part of what we have. Of course, you think about that because the, the armor of God is not wishy-washy. It's not anything that is... Um, to be taken lightly because it is heavy. It's a heavy responsibility to take up the armor of God and fight. And fight this good fight of faith. And this is one this is something else I want to bring up right here. In that Second Corinthians chapter ten and verse five. Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse five. And we're talking about what keeps you captive, the strongholds in your life that have been keeping you captive. A stronghold is anything that keeps you captive. You think about that and what, what it is. And if you're not sure what it is, then you need to ask the Holy Spirit to open up that area of your life and show you what it is. I recently had something come up that I needed to get taken care of. And my wife knows what that is. And I needed to take care of that and bring it up. And the Holy, yeah, the whole, the Holy Spirit convicted me about not paying my student loans. And that's, it's sad because... I, I could have had them paid off a long time ago. Today, it's a huge burden. Anyway. And just... just <laughs> anyway. But it was also a thing of, just like with you, on putting on your armor, I mean, it was a thing of almost as soon as he made that decision, we've had another situation come up that's, going to make that difficult yes it will but my God shall supply all, all our, our needs. needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus and he is the God of redemption yeah. he has ways of redeeming us and time and finances and I know we're going to get out of it. We're going to get it. It's going to get resolved, yeah. including the, I mean, both situations. Absolutely. Are going to be resolved. And, you know, yes, it's going to be a, a I, it, it, mm. Okay, I'm going to pull you, your, your scripture. You, we need to go back a little bit further. Verse 3, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not but carnal. mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. I verse got it right five. there on the board. Yeah. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That's verse 4. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity in the obedience of Christ. Yep. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Warfare is within your mind. Your thought processes are part of warfare. Now I'm going to flip back to 1 Corinthians 10. Um, let's see. Starting at verse 12 and 13. Uh, again, that's 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Common. Everyone say common. Common. It's common. Everybody's faced it. Yeah, that's right. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God always provides the way out of the situation to where you can be victorious. That's right. The one thing that is very important here is that when you have a thought that is exalt is trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And for me, a lot of times it's just seeing a woman walking down the street, and especially in the summertime these days, you, the women are not wearing modest clothing. And it is a challenge for, for at me at times. And I, when now, when I'm faced with that, I quote this scripture, I cast down every thought and imagination that exalts itself against you, O oh Lord, and my, that's going to try to destroy me. And that young lady that I see walking down the street right now, I just lift her up to you in Jesus' name, and I ask that you send workers of the harvest across her path to minister your love to her and draw her in. There's a lot of things that happen in a day-to-day day -day time frame that come up against you. And if you are not prepared spiritually for that incident, and sometimes it, it, it sneaks up on you because the devil, when he starts when he starts going after you, he has only one line of attack. He, what, what Rick brings out inside the study guide about how the devil operates is that he has one particular way of constantly, constantly coming back at you with that thought. And today, when, after we got home from the morning meeting, I, I, I put on Rick Renner's teaching on uh, strongholds, overcoming strongholds. And he gave his personal testimony. I suggest you guys take a look at his YouTube channel for that. And the, also the teaching on the armor of God. It doesn't look like we're going to get through all of this tonight. But casting down arguments in every high, high thing. Now you remember, 
Satan is, was the lead worshiper, and you would think that he would, that he would have had a more intimate type of relationship with the, the Father. There's also a scripture that I want to go to in Isaiah. Um, I looked this up this morning. It's not in, I don't think I have it in my notes here. Nope, I did not. Um, let me let me borrow my tablet there, huh? Yeah. Or are you? Oh, you're you're responding to someone. Okay. Um, basically, I think maybe um, let's see. Isaiah it says, "I created the blacksmith." Who, big, who makes the tool. And I also created the destroyer, the person that comes against you, that devil. And basically what he says is that no weapon will formed against you will prosper. And what that's telling us today is that I created him. I created a devil. I know how to take care of him. Put your trust in me. And then you, by casting down those thoughts and imaginations and being obedient to the word, you are becoming that conqueror. You're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. There's something else I want to go to here. Um... When I brought this out last month in, in the teaching that I had uh, from last month about um, guarding your mind, guarding your hearts against the, not just the wiles of the devil, but false teaching, uh, deception. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Uh, I got news for you all. This is not a multiple choice test that you're giving the spirits, okay? Not multiple choice, okay? Whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Verse 2. By this you know the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Every spirit and this also includes anything that comes up uh, in a, as a presence in your room that may you know, during a prayer time, and you notice a presence in your room that is something else. And I've had to do this. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard has come and is already in the world. Now, there was a time and I was in prayer and I was in deep intercession. I don't know, I don't remember when, but I sensed in the Holy, in the power of the Holy Spirit, within my spirit, that something had entered the room. I was there alone, praying by myself. And so all I did was say it, I, I said it out loud, is to this presence in the room, is Jesus Christ come in the flesh? They have to answer they must answer the question, yes or no. Very simple. Because the word says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is from the evil one. That's so important. When you are trying to help yourself, guard your heart and your mind. Let this same mind be in you as in Christ Jesus. That's what the word says. 
And what we've been doing tonight is just exhorting and learning from, uh, from just examples. And before you start to play, dear, I want to ask Jeff if he's got anything else he wants to add. Um, some of you have heard my testimony. Um, I was at a place where I fell. Uh, I told the Lord, no, it's not a good place to be. Uh, you find yourself on your own. And every door to the enemy is completely opened up. Yep. Um, yep. Within a four-month time, I had a twisted ankle, a broken hand, a root canal that was not supposed to be done because I had four impacted wisdom teeth. And then I did find myself, after I broke up with my first girlfriend, in a bar with f multiple witnesses. And I didn't drink, but my two friends drank. And I'll just wrap this up real quick. Jesus himself, Matthew 4, was actually in the desert, but it says that Satan himself took him to the pinnacle. How's that possible? Well, I found out how it's possible. My body was in that bar, but I was actually taken up before the throne of Satan. And here I am, I've said no to God, and I'm being tempted every way possible that an 18-year-old can be tempted. And he is giving me all of these vivid pictures of everything that he will give me if I would just bow down and worship him. And remember this, I went to a church that taught me Satan doesn't exist. Oh, Lord. That was how much training I had. But here's the glory to God. I didn't know anything, but for hours, I had one thing that I knew. I knew I had to make a decision. And in those two hours, I finally made the decision. I said, no, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. The very name was all I knew. And that's all that it took to defeat Satan himself on his throne in front of his entire kingdom with no one else there but me. But the name of Jesus, which was not even allowed to be spoken for 4,000 years until Mary was actually the first to hear Yeshua, which is actually the same word for salvation. That very name is all you need to defeat the enemy from all the way, from the top of the kingdom all the way down. And you never have to be afraid of anyone or anything that he has in that gospel. And you know when that peace comes up and you can take that stand. But anyway, I just wanted to share that because his name is more powerful than any name that Satan can come up with. Thank you, Jeff. I want to bring out this. This is also brings us to that we have the power and the authority. Yeah, I know we need to close. This is, this is coming up. Uh, we're, we are. Ro I want to give you Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life Laheim in the Hebrew, to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. I also want to give you this one right here on the board. Luke ten nineteen. Behold, I give you authority. And that word authority is dunamis, the power that describes the explosive power of God through his spirit. That is ability, the inherent power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or a person or thing exerts, puts forth. That is the power to perform miracles, the power of resources. That is the power consisting or resting upon armies and forces of hosts. You have 
the authority, the power. The Greek word for authority is exousia. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing will hurt you. That is a... The authority is the strength which one is endued that he possesses or exercises. And Jesus says, I give you the authority. You are, got, you are you're clothed in his righteousness. You are, you have that shield of faith. You have the blowing belt of truth. Close your eyes and picture yourself in your armor. You are not defeated. You are standing and you are standing on those, those killer shoes with the spikes in them. And you're treading on, you're trampling on serpents and scorpions, demonic powers and forces. You are bringing down strongholds. In the name of Jesus, we come against every stronghold right now that exalts itself against the knowledge and the word of God in our lives. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for this time and this place of being able to come and worship you and, and to expound on what you, the desire of your heart is, Lord, for every believer to be dressed in the full armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 11. These three scriptures, 2 Corinthians 10.4, Luke 10.19, and Ephesians 6.11. If you get anything out of this tonight, get that down inside your heart. Hold fast to that. Stand. And don't let anything get in your way. Remember, the angels bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone, but they also go before you and they clear a path for you. So we proclaim a clear path, Lord, in the realm of the Spirit for everyone on Facebook Live that is watching right now. Whatever you're struggling with right now, the victory is yours. The victory is yours. The victory is yours in Jesus' name. Rise up, army of the Lord. Rise up. Awaken. We call the army of the Lord to awaken and rise up as brothers and sisters in Christ. And rise up in love. And we rise up. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for this time again and again and again. And we walk away changed in our hearts, Lord. And we ask you, Father God, to bless the word and all those who are in hearing. I have sown. The Holy Spirit is watering the word. And the seed that is sown is going to grow and produce a harvest. And we ask and we give you the praise, honor, and glory for that harvest, Lord harvest of souls, the healing, the healing in the minds and hearts of the people. We give you the glory, Father God, for that. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Right now, I just feel led to blow the shofar. And we're going to shout the victory. All right? Praise God. Praise God.
Blessed be the Lord our God, King of the universe, who commands us to hear the sound of the shofar. The sound of the shofar is the sound of his own voice as proclaimed by Moses in the, at the giving of the law on that day and also the day of Pentecost. The power of the Holy Spirit sweeping in as a mighty wind and the flames of the Holy Spirit the resting on everyone and everyone on here and everyone on Facebook Live in Jesus' name. We proclaim the victory. Yeah. 